I can remember my first AIDS-related memory in December 1981, before AIDS was a term. I remember reading with interest three papers that came out in the New England Journal about gay-related immunodeficiency disease. This new disease in hemophilia seemed to be very similar to the gay-related immunodeficiency disease that was published. The first question I asked was, am I susceptible to this disease? And I used a lot of denial. Denial is a really important trait when you've got hemophilia, and it got me through my young life up to that point. I was about uh, 23 years old. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe this is affecting some people in the community, but certainly it's not going to affect me. And as 1983 and 1984 came along, more and more individuals with hemophilia were dying from this new disease. AIDS. The first person I knew that passed away was from my northern Ohio chapter, uh, and he lived uh, down the road um, from Cleveland. Uh, he was on the board with me uh, in the northern Ohio chapter, and one day he just died. And that was when it began to strike home that uh, how do you know if you're susceptible? How do you know if you're going to die? Should I be more worried about this? Hemophilia is a disease where the blood doesn't clot as fast as it should normally. Hemophilia represents one of two clotting factors that are missing from the blood, either factor 9 or factor 8. These two clotting factors work together with a whole series of other clotting factors in a cascade that results in clot formation. So one starts with a wound, these clotting factors get activated in sequence, and then at the end of that sequence, we've got a nice clot that seals up that wound. If one is missing factor eight or factor nine, the two most common forms of hemophilia, a very weak, friable clot forms that can easily break or get dislodged, and so bleeding lasts for a longer period of time. That results in uh, bleeding into the uh, internal organs, uh, but most predominantly bleeding into the joints. The joints are particularly susceptible to, uh, to this type of bleeding. That results in blood accumulation in the joint. That blood is corrosive, and as our body works to get rid of the blood, it releases lots of inflammatory mediators that do get rid of the blood, but they also get rid of the synovial membrane, the cartilage, and the bone itself along the way. And so if one has repeated bleeds that number in the hundreds inside of a joint over a period of 10 or 20 years, that joint will be pretty well destroyed. Hemophilia can also cause life-threatening hemorrhages, such as intracerebral hemorrhages. If we have a bleed in the brain, there's no room in the brain for blood to accumulate. Everything in the brain is vital. And so that blood then um, really can be lethal. And most of the time it is lethal unless treatment occurs early. Fresh frozen plasma was developed in World War II and it became more widely available by the early 1950s for the treatment of hemophilia. However, it didn't work very well because the concentration of the clotting factors, factor eight or factor nine, were very, were very low in fresh frozen plasma. And so as a result, uh, it would take a lot of fresh frozen plasma in order to control a bleeding episode. That would result in circulatory overload, uh, congestive heart failure, so one was limited in being able to control bleeds, and for that reason, it wasn't particularly effective. So there was no treatment for hemophilia until the 1965-1966 time point in which a material called cryoprecipitate uh, had been invented. And that material was a concentrate from fresh frozen plasma that had an increased amount of factor VIII activity in it. Um, that didn't take a lot of fluid, didn't cause congestive heart failure, and because it had such a high amount of factor VIII, when it was administered, it would stop a bleed just like that. So that was a miracle drug to individuals with hemophilia. Shortly after cryo became available, uh, the pharmaceutical industry got involved. Uh, it looked like this might be an opportunity to make a more convenient form of cryo. The pharmaceutical industry began pooling large amounts of plasma together and then running it through protein purification columns to make a more concentrated form of factor VIII and factor IX. The development of these lyophilized concentrates allowed people a freedom that they had never had before. It allowed one to travel, uh, to carry the factor with uh, with us in our suitcases, 
and if a bleed developed, to be able to treat that bleed right away. So that was the beginning of aggressive on-demand therapy. That allows us to keep going and to maintain our full lifestyle, but it also allows us to preserve the joints a little bit more because so much less blood has to be cleaned out. Eventually though, if you have 10 or 20 bleeding episodes a year, the joint will get destroyed. What then developed was the concept of prophylaxis. Let's prevent these bleeds from ever happening. Wouldn't that be much better for joint health and wouldn't that prevent the occasional major accident that could risk mortality? Prophylaxis became the standard of care for children with hemophilia. Today, prophylaxis is used by increasing numbers of adults and even though they may have joint damage, it will slow further progression of the joint damage and allow them to maintain a much more active lifestyle. What we did not recognize at the time was that the pooled clotting factor concentrates were pooled from uh, donors uh, that numbered in the um, many, many thousands. 60,000, even 120,000 donors their plasma would go into these pools. And so if you had one individual uh, in that donor pool of 120,000 that had a high amount of HIV, or for that matter, hepatitis viruses, they would contaminate the entire pool. Not everybody who took that would get the infection because we had natural resistance. But if you took a lot of it, you took repeated doses, then chances were good that you would get infected. By the early 1980s, most of the lots of plasma-derived clotting factor that were produced were contaminated by HIV. That precipitated rapid research to try to do viral inactivation on the plasma that was being prepared. That did succeed, but not before the vast majority of the community got infected. AIDS was associated with IV drug abuse, with homosexuality. It was something that um, that people were beginning to be shunned, and that spilled over into the hemophilia community. So by 1984, I went from being somebody who was very proactive about talking about my disease and sharing my experiences. I was happy to, happy to be um, very open and vocal about dealing with hemophilia and living with uh, the, the good and the bad. It coincided with me actually moving out of town. That helped. Uh, I took a residency in St. Louis, uh, and, uh, and, and so I was able to have a fresh start, and I just, I made a decision that I wasn't going to tell anybody I had hemophilia. I was concerned because I was practicing medicine, and should I be practicing medicine if I might be infected? And remember, we didn't have an antibody test at that time, so I didn't know if I was infected or not. But I did know that I was a heavy user of clotting factor concentrates. So if I was susceptible to some bloodborne disease, chances are I got it. I found out in 1986 that I did in fact uh, have what then became known as HIV. I found out because I contacted my physician back in Cleveland. I knew he had stored my serum samples. I knew that they had tested them. I didn't really want to know the result um, at that time, but I wanted to do some family planning and think about having children. So I wrote to him and he sent me a note back saying, yes, in fact, you are positive. You were negative in 1981 and you were positive in 1983. So what's really truly remarkable is that I certainly never thought in 1986 when I found this out that in 2016 I would be 34 years into uh, my HIV infection uh, still sitting here and talking. I don't have survivor's guilt. I am very appreciative for having survived. I think I have contributed to that um, by um, being extremely aggressive in going after the latest antiviral medications and doing everything I could to shut the uh, shut the virus down. I don't feel survivor's guilt. I do feel very badly about the number of very close friends that I have lost. I'm especially affected by the people that I lost in the 1995 time frame. I lost three very close friends uh, from the hemophilia community uh, at that time. As they were dying, my T-cell counts were down to zero.
And if uh, the past was any prediction, um, the following year would most likely be my last year. Some opportunistic infection would come along and, and take me out. And so I had um, what might be called a come to Jesus meeting with my physician. I was in San Diego at the time. Uh, and I said, I'm just not ready to die. Uh, what are we gonna do? And so he discussed a new antiviral that had just come out onto the market, but it didn't work. Uh, it was a protease inhibitor, the first of the protease inhibitors that came out. But as they ran the clinical trials, they didn't use the correct dose. So he arbitrarily put me on a double dose of that, added two other medications, and within six months, my CD4 T cells began coming back. My viral load went from 100,000 down to zero, or undetectable, and I started feeling much better. So 1996 was my turnaround year, and if those, those new medications hadn't been available, it would have been my last year. One of my major regrets is that my friends who did pass away in 1995 really died one year too short, and if they had only been able to last another year, uh, some of them might be with me today. The vast majority of the community was also infected with a virus called hepatitis C. It wasn't known until 1990 as hepatitis C when it was actually discovered, but prior to that it was called hepatitis non-A, non-B, because it wasn't hepatitis A and it wasn't hepatitis B. One to two percent of the general population had it, and so as they became blood donors, it got transmitted through blood. We accepted this in the 1970s as the cost of treatment. It appeared to be a benign disease, um, but what we didn't know is it was, it was an insidious disease, and it very quietly destroyed the liver over a period of decades. And so while you don't see anything in the first 10 years after infection, if one biopsied the liver, which did occur in the late 1970s, one could find areas of cirrhosis. That was our first clue. But as a community, we denied it. If we had paid more attention to that as a community and worked to eliminate it, we would have developed viral inactivation techniques that actually would have prevented HIV from having infected the community because the same viral inactivation techniques will, will destroy both of those types of viruses. By the early 1980s, our community was somewhere around 15 to 18,000 individuals. People have looked at the retrospective serum samples that they kept on patients. The earliest infections were identified in 1979, so much of the infection occurred prior to even the understanding that there was this new disease. We had our first deaths from AIDS in the summer of 1982. Um, by the end of 1982, uh, instead of three people, it was eight people that had died. By January or February of 1983, it was into the teens, and then it just continued to escalate uh, in an exponential curve. By the mid-1990s, an average of one person a day with hemophilia was dying from HIV, AIDS. The individuals with severe or a severe moderate type of disease were the ones that utilized a large amount of clotting factor concentrate. At least 90% of that population became infected with HIV. From that group, um, which we would estimate at somewhere in the 8 to 10,000 range, um, the vast majority of those individuals are dead today. We would estimate perhaps 2,000 or so, maybe a little less uh, uh, individuals are still alive uh, at this point in time in 2016. The pharmaceutical industry that supplied the lyophilized clotting factor concentrates recognized in the 1970s that these were transmitting hepatitis viruses. That was accepted as a consequence of therapy uh, and shouldn't interfere with continuation of therapy. It was a relatively benign uh, disease at that time, and it wasn't recognized that over a period of decades it would destroy the liver. An another important point about hepatitis C that wasn't recognized is that when HIV came along, it accelerated HCV disease. So if the immune system is wiped out by HIV, hepatitis C was able to run rampant. And what that resulted in is many of my friends dying not of HIV, but of HCV 
as a consequence of their HIV. No viral inactivation technologies were implemented um, due to HCV. People were concerned about the cost. Uh, at that time, clotting factor cost around six to eight cents a unit. Uh, and the pharmaceutical company said it would double in cost if they had to develop viral inactivation. Well, when HIV came along, that created a much more urgent crisis. The pharmaceutical companies began to recognize by early 1983 that this mysterious immune deficiency disease was being transmitted by clotting factor concentrates. The fact that it was found in these individuals with hemophilia that had no other risk factors, they weren't Haitian, they weren't homosexual, and they weren't IV drug abusers. And then what clinched it was a transfusion that a baby had received in December of 1983, and he acquired uh, this immune deficiency disease from a single, a single transfusion. So while that recognition was apparent, um, what to do about it was not. Uh, because remember, in 1983, a few people were dying, but most people weren't. And so where were we on this infection curve? And were most people, in fact, immune to this new virus? Did they get it and recover from it? It turned out they did not, but that wasn't fully understood or appreciated at that period of time. So the pharmaceutical companies were slow to recognize this. Uh, they did go ahead and implement viral inactivation technologies. Um, but they were slow to remove uh, the clotting factor concentrates that were not virally inactivated from the marketplace. They preferred instead to allow them to be, to be used up. The hemophilia treatment center community also, um, in some instances, continued to use clotting factor concentrates that were not virally inactivated after the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council for the National Hemophilia Foundation indicated in 1984 that uh, only viral inactivated concentrates should be used. So there was some denial on all parts. There was denial by patients that this was really going to be a lethal disease. Uh, there was denial by physicians and healthcare practitioners that their, their kids that they had taken care of throughout their lives were really susceptible to a fatal disease. Uh, and there was denial at multiple levels within the pharmaceutical companies. When HIV and AIDS was recognized in hemophilia, it was clear that it was transmitted through blood products and blood transfusions. And that helped to mobilize a public health response that probably would have been somewhat slower to mobilize for the other high-risk groups that received HIV and AIDS. In that sense, we were able to accelerate the expenditure of public health dollars to develop a test to detect HIV, to develop further tests to improve the safety of the blood supply and eliminate virtually any risk of HIV being present in the blood supply. But it did have an impact on the government in mobilizing resources to fight HIV and AIDS.